thank you for having me. Uh, <clears throat> the good thing about our game, the great thing about our game is that everybody has opinions <clears throat> and ideas. Uh, what I'm about to talk about is my opinion and my idea. These things that I'm going to talk about this evening have a track record and they've worked for me. Some may agree with them, some may disagree. But the beauty of our game is everybody has an opinion and everybody can tweak what they want to tweak and, and use what they want to use. <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is, is mainly, mainly with routine ground balls, but what I'm going to talk about also can work with backhands, slow rollers, and the balls that hit the dirt. Now that ball hit dirt thing is a thing I came with, up with about 10 years ago. So if you want to know what ball hit dirt mean, we can, you can, uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A sessions afterward. But this works for, for all skills. But for the simplification and the time we have tonight, I'm going to talk about the routine ground ball right at you, a couple steps left or right. But it works for all those things I just talked about. I came up with the six Fs years ago because I think as coaches, sometimes we get too complicated in what we teach. We should really keep it simple. This is something that you can teach to an eight-year-old and you can teach to a major leaguer. These are the same concepts I've used in the big leagues for over 25 years. Same methods. You make it short and simple. The, the first time you talk about this thing is, is about a 15 or 20 minute explanation. You explain it. But afterwards, there are six key words that all you have to remember to get your players back on track. And they all start with the letter F. That's what I came up with, the six Fs of fielding. The first F is feet. Feet is the uh, ready position or the pre-pitch movement. Now, everybody has their own idea of this. Uh, I always use the concept of the relay race. And I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence. We all know what the pre-pitch is and how to get ready. <clears throat> but I like to explain it in detail the first time, and then it's easier for the players to understand. It's like the relay race. Are you quicker? If you stand still, the guy hands you the baton, then you take off. Or if you get a running start, then he hands you the baton. Obviously, it's that one. So if you're moving when the ball's in the hitting zone, you're going to be quicker to get to the ball. Every sport probably does this. The, the best example I can use besides baseball is tennis. Those of you that watch tennis, when the guy's getting ready to hit the, the serve, the person on the other side of the net always gets into a ready position. In baseball, there are different ways to do that. This is what I teach. There are simple other ways to do it. This is what I like. Before the pitcher does anything, you can be standing any way you want, as relaxed as you want to be, just like you're talking to somebody on the street. As soon as the pitcher makes his first move, whether it's the wind up here or out of the stretch, when he makes his first move, you get your glove off your body and bend your back. Preferably get your glove open when you do that. Bend, get your glove off your body, bend your back. When the pitcher's arm starts to go forward, right about the ear level, it starts to go forward right about here, is when you do what a tennis player does. You take that small step with your right foot, and then you separate. So it looks like that. When the, ball's hit, when the ball's in the hitting zone, you're going to hit on the balls of your feet every time. It doesn't matter if you're throwing from 45 feet and 50 miles an hour, or if you're throwing from 60 feet, 6 inches at 100 miles an hour, the timing works. A good way to practice this is around the batting cage. When your players are waiting for their turn to hit, all they have to do is watch the batting practice pitcher. He makes his first move, bend your back, his arm goes forward, it's small, separate. And when you do that, you'll hear the ping of the bat in the batting cage every time your feet Balls of your feet hit the ground. The timing, it works every single time. That's why I like this one. It's foolproof. It works every single time. So once again, any way you want to stand comfortable, pitcher makes his first move, you bend your back, glove off your body. Arm starts to go forward, it's small, separate. The timing is impeccable every time. Now, notice I did say small, separate. If your step gets too big... And then you separate, you're going to be in the air and the ball's in the hitting zone. And that's something we don't want to do, obviously. 
So when you're talking to your players, the example I use is half your shoe size. So if it's small, means half your shoe size. That keeps them from going big. Half your shoe size. Small, separate, and you're ready to go. It's your ready position. As soon as the ball's in the hitting zone, you're going to come down on the balls of your feet every single time and be able to react and move as quickly as possible. First F, feet. Second F. We're getting to the ball. Now we're going to feel the ball. Now, when I was a kid, I used to have coaches give me so much information. Get your, get your butt down. Bend your back. Get your hands out front. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a lot of stuff to be thinking about when the ball's coming towards you. So if I get my butt down, bend my back, get my hands out front, sometimes I could have a balance problem. I just don't, to me, it just doesn't feel right. There's other ways to make it simpler to get your point across. My way of explaining it is get a wide base. A wide base is somewhere between two and three inches past your shoulders with each foot. If you break down to field your ground ball with the regular right left footwork and you have a wide base, your, your feet are two to three inches past your shoulder, which is going to be different for everyone depending on your height. When you lay your glove down, all those things happen automatically. Your butt is down, your back is flat, your hands are out front. The people who talk about get your butt down, bend your back, get your hands out front, but they don't dress your feet, at some point in time, I have a blind spot here. I can't get my glove out front. If I try to get my glove out front, I go into a balance problem. Those, that leads to, if you do catch that ball, that leads to a long action of footwork, at least probably three steps before you can throw the ball, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. But a wide base also creates balance. Here's the thing I like to talk about also. If you want to be a good hitter, you have to see two things at the same time. You have to see the ball and the bat, correct? If you want to be a good, consistent infielder, you have to see two things at the same time. You have to see the ball and your glove. If your base is so narrow, you can't see, you're looking at the ball, but you can't see your glove, that means you have a blind spot in here, about the last six or eight inches before the ball gets to you. The ball that hits the heel of your glove or your wrist, remember how we used to say, oh, Johnny, get a next one. That's a bad hop. That's not a bad hop. That ball only bounced that far. Why, why did the player make it into a bad hop? Because he couldn't see it. So he couldn't react. When you go to a major league game and you see a guy make a play like that, that's by design. That's by practice. That's not luck. If you have get it break down into a wide base and you lay your glove down, it is so far out in front, I can see the ball and the glove at the same time. That's when I see that ball take that hop. I can see it and I can react to it. The guys that have narrow bases, their glove stays back. They're looking at the ball. At some point in time, there's a blind spot here. If the ball does anything but stay on the ground, you're in trouble. So if you want to be a good, consistent infielder, you have to see two things at the same time, the ball and your glove. The other thing it does for you, it creates balance. Obviously, I'm under complete control here. The guy with the narrow base that is told to get his hands out front, eventually his hands go so far out front, his glove comes off the ground. If he does catch it, he has to stop himself from falling over, and then it's going to lead to long footwork before he can throw the ball. So the key to number two, field, is a wide base, ball and glove in the same view, and balance. Now we've caught the ball. The ball's in our glove. Now we're going to funnel the ball. The third one is funnel. Funnel, big area, comes to a small area. Okay, let's talk about this one for a second. Every sport, almost every sport, starts in the middle of your body. 
before you throw something. For me, the middle of your body is the perfect throwing position. If we're going to fight, where do you hold your fist? Right in the middle of your body, in the chest area. That's where you throw your punch. Quarterbacks go back to pass. Where are they holding a football? Look at any picture you want in any paper or any magazine. Quarterback holds the ball right here. He doesn't hold it down here or over here or up here. He holds it right here. Basketball pass. Right in the middle. It's where you pass the ball. Tennis. Before they toss the ball up, they, they all go right back to the middle of the body before anything happens. A pitcher. Doesn't matter if you throw from down here, submarine, or on the top, or whatever. The last place your hands are before they separate is always in the middle of the body. When you play catch in the backyard, and your buddy throws it over here, you don't take it over here to throw it, and you don't take it here to throw it, and you don't take it here to throw it. You take it to the middle of your body, and then you throw it back to your buddy. For the life of me, I cannot figure out why infielders catch that ground ball and want to take it away from their body? Because nobody else in sports, before they throw something, does that. And we don't do it when we play catch. So to me, it doesn't make a bit of sense. I like to funnel the ball back to the middle of the body. If it's inside your body, it's easy. It's right here to the middle. If it's outside your body, you get it back to your body, just like you do when you play catch in the backyard. If it's to your backhand, you get it there, but you get it back to the middle while your feet catch up. You get the ball back to the middle of the body. You funnel the ball. This is the perfect throwing position. <clears throat> From here, when I feel the ball, I like to go into the glove with my whole hand. I don't like to go in the glove with the grip. If I go in with the grip and I don't find it, I'm in trouble. If I go in the grip and it splits, I split it, I'm in trouble. I tell my infielders all the time, I'd rather the band be safe at first than safe at second. Going in with the grip leads to problems, in my opinion. If I go in with my whole hand, I can find the ball, I can find my four-seam grip, as I funnel the ball here to the middle of my body. Okay, now, once I get to the ball in the middle of my body, here are four things that we as coaches tell our players all the time. And the purpose of the six Fs is once you explain it to them, then the word funnel is gonna take care of all of it. We always tell the players to have a front side before they throw, correct? Yes, we do. We also tell an infielder he has to have short arm action. He can't drop it and swing it like an outfielder or a pitcher. It has to be short. Your elbow has to be up to be a perfect throwing position. And your hand has to be behind the ball. Talk about those four, all four here in just a second. But you know what? If you funnel and you separate, once your hands get to the middle of your body and you separate thumbs down, all four of those things happen automatically. So once you explain this and demonstrate this to your players, the one key word now is funnel, and they've got it forever. When you funnel and separate thumbs down, here's your front side. We all talk about pitching coaches, talk about a front side. You got to have a front side to throw. When you funnel thumbs down, your arm stays short. It's right there. Your, my elbow is automatically up, and my hand is on top of the ball. So when you stop an infielder or a pitcher through throwing at some point in time, this is what you're going to see on any highlight or any, a baseball card, a magazine. You're going to have the elbow, shoulder, shoulder, elbow lined up. Well, if you funnel and break thumbs down, that happens automatically. You don't have to keep talking about get your sh arm short, get your elbow up, get on top of the ball. It's done. Once you explain it, it's done. Funnel. Funnel, thumbs down, perfect throwing mechanics. Why is it important that when you funnel thumbs down that your hand is on top of the ball? Your hand has to be on top of the ball, has to be. If you funnel thumbs down, when your hand's on top of the ball, at the, at you get to the release point, your hand is always behind.
behind the ball. Behind something is when you have leverage and power. I talked about the guys a minute ago that take the ball away from their body. Number one, they're going to lose their front side. They have to get it back somehow. So they have to be violent with their front side. Eh, no good. They got a long arm action. Eh, no good. The elbow has a really good chance of being underneath the shoulder. Eh, no good. And the hand, more times than not, is either going to be under the ball or on the side of the ball. Now, if you're coaching eight, nine, ten year olds, they're not going to have arm strength. They're going to get away from. They can get away from that. But once you get arm strength, and you start throwing the ball with your hand on the side or underneath, this is where you get the sinkers. And if you don't correct that before a kid turns 13 or 14, then you got problems. It's really hard to relearn things the older you get, right? We're all in that boat. The older you get, it's harder to learn things. So if you funnel and separate thumbs down. There's four things you never have to worry about again. You have your front side. You have your short arm action. Your elbow is up and your hand's on top of the ball. It's done. Funnel. Feet. Field. Funnel. Now, to give you an example, I was talking about earlier, if I go to my backhand, it's the same thing. My gloves are out front. Here's my funnel. I separate thumbs down. Ball goes to my left. I can't get it, I get my balance back, and I funnel, thumbs down. It's every, it's every ground ball, every ground ball. Funnel, get the ball back to the middle of your body, separate thumbs down. One last time, because this is important. Once you get the basic groundwork laid, you never have to worry about anything but the key word again, and that kicks the player's memory, funnel. Front side, elbow up. Short arm action, hand on top of the ball. <clears throat> Once I funnel the ball, as I'm funneling the ball, the fourth F kicks in the gear. They happen at the same time. This is footwork. This is the fourth F. Now remember, I talked earlier about the wide base. The kids, the players that don't have a wide base or the staggered base, once they reach out for the ball, they kind of lose their balance and they have to stop. So there's one step, then here's another step, and then they have to do something else to throw it. So it takes three steps to throw the ball. A lot of times the guys with a narrow bases, takes them a long time to throw the ball. I'm not a big guy, I, I, I'm not a big guy that likes crossing your feet when the ball is in your glove. And I'm going to give you reasons why. You have to cross your feet to get angles. I understand that. Once the ball's in your glove, I'm not a big proponent of crossing your feet to throw the ball. And I'll tell you why, and then I'll give you what I like to teach. <clears throat> the kids that, or players that feel the ball and lead with their right foot. <clears throat> Before you throw in a ground ball, think about an infielder. The base of, from first base or home plate to first base is 90 feet. By the time they get the ground ball, you're working with 70 feet, maybe less. So you have to get what I call the two D's as quick as you can. The two D's, distance and direction. You've got to gain some ground to your target and get that shoulder lined up to your target. Distance and direction as quick as you can. Let's look at the guy who crosses in front. I'm going to feel this ground ball and I'm going to, I'm going to take this step to my target. Number one, I, I gained a little distance, a little. But where is my direction? It's in the same spot it was when I caught the ground ball. Didn't do anything. So I'm behind already. The guys who cross their feet behind, they're going sideways. Their shoulder turns a little bit, but it's not anywhere near their target. They have to do something else to throw it. If they don't, they understand there's my target now what has to happen for them to hit their target? What has to happen with their arm? Their arm has to make up the difference. That's when it drops. That's when it gets long. That's when your elbow gets low. That's when your hand gets underneath the ball. And then that's when you get sinkers. <clears throat> if I'm going to take a secondary lead at first base and you're coaching me 
and I took my secondary lead and I did this, what would you probably tell me? What in the world are you doing? You can't cross your feet. You can't hop. You can't skip. What are you doing? Well, wait a minute, coach. You told me it's okay to cross my feet here and get ready to throw, but it's not okay to cross my feet here. Sometimes as coaches, we send mixed messages and we confuse players. So how would you tell the guy to take a secondary lead? This foot goes where this one is. This one goes to its target and you gain distance and direction and you keep your balance because your feet are low to the ground. Why can't we translate that to fielding a ground ball? Watch what happens. Remember I talked about the guy who did this? No direction. This comes down. Oh, shoot, I'm still not lined up. Had to do something else. So I traveled about 10, 12 feet. If I field this ground ball and my formula is right to left, left to my target, I call this replacing your feet, just like you replace your feet on a, on a secondary lead. Do I get the two Ds at the same time? Absolutely. I get distance and direction at the same time. I'm square to the ball, hands are out front, I got my funnel, right to left, left to my target. I gain distance and direction in one step. I'm ready to throw the ball. If the player can't run, I don't have the grip, whatever the case may be, I replace them again. But I never cross my feet. Once the ball's in my glove, I replace my feet because it ensures me that I know I'm getting the two Ds at the same time. I'm getting distance and direction with minimal steps. Period. At my level, it's important. I don't have a lot of time when a D. Gordon or a Juan Pierre or any of those type of players are running. I better get distance and direction as quick as I can. The two Ds. So if you're a left-hander, obviously, and you're throwing to second base, it's going to be just the opposite. It's going to be left to right, right to my target. First baseman probably never throws the ball to third base from a standstill. But if I'd use that formula, it would take me right to third base. Easily. The second baseman who's going to his left has to have that severe angle. I'm going to talk about it here in just a second, too. Has a severe angle to first base. If, he used to, if he's used to crossing... One, two, three to get to that severe angle. If he crosses behind, he's going back towards center field. That's where you get in trouble. But although my angle is really sharp and I'm going to throw the ball to first base, if I replace my feet, it takes me right where I want to go. Minimal steps. I don't have to get extra steps. I've created my angle. And remember this, fellas and ladies. When you're on the field and you go to your right, your angle to first base becomes larger and larger and larger. It's easier to replace your feet. Anytime you go to your left, your angle to first base becomes sharper and smaller. Your feet have really got to work quick. And if you don't correct the kids that cross, they're going to have a hard time when they go to their left, getting rid of the ball and throwing it accurately and quickly. Period. Something to think about. Fifth F. Okay, I'm finally there. Now I'm ready to throw the ball. I could have had five Fs and a T. That didn't sound right. So I had to come up with another one for F. So I'm, gonna, I'm ready to fire the ball. And now I'm ready to throw it. Now I've prepared the ball correctly, the perfect throwing position. I've separated thumbs down. I've replaced my feet where I've got the two Ds distance and direction, and now I'm pretty confident that I can throw the ball straight. I have a drill I use at the major league level. That D. Gordon was a mess when he came to us. He'd been sent down a couple of times with the Dodgers. Once I got him to funnel the ball and replace his feet, I had him, once the ball's in his glove, after I hit him a ground ball, I told him to close his eyes. Good drill to use. Have you ever seen anybody take a ball and throw it with their eye? What do you throw with? If your feet work, take you toward your target, you throw with your feet. 
And if you're prepared the ball in a perfect throwing position, you don't need your eyes to throw. Try this with your kids. Make sure that they know what they're doing first. <laughs> and clear out behind them. But once you know they funnel and thumbs down, and once you know they're not crossing their feet anymore, you'll throw the ball straight with their eyes closed, and then you've got them. Then you can tell them to stand on their head, or be at practice an hour early, or wash your car. You got them. You got them. Save that drill until you know they do those things. You don't have to worry about it, and they're going to be amazed. You can throw with your eyes closed. You throw with your feet. You don't throw with your arm. You don't throw with your eyes. You got the doubters on that one? Have them face this way. Take a ball in their hand and tell them to throw it. Give them a target that way and tell them to throw the ball. They're going to do this. Okay, their arm goes back and it goes forward. Now turn them around. Give them the ball. Tell them to throw it to the same target. Now it's a lot easier, isn't it? You've just proved that to them one simple little demonstration. The only thing I did different is turn my feet. It made my arm work. If your feet work, your arm works. Your bottom half controls your upper half. Think about a basketball player. Reach in, foul. What they tell you in basketball, don't cross your feet on defense. Don't reach in, move, get in front of the guy. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You throw with your feet. So we're firing the ball. The last F is follow. Once you let go of the ball, once you feel the release of the ball, you should take at least one or two steps, preferably two. That ensures that you get carry and accuracy. And it eliminates this guy. It eliminates the recoil. You don't want the recoil because your arm never finishes. You can leave balls up. I'm going to talk about that in here in one second. It eliminates the recoil. It gives your ball carry and accuracy. All of us in this room have a really good chance, if we played catch at 100 feet, of throwing better than Omar Vizquel. But Omar Vizquel had perfect footwork, average arm strength, but his feet worked, and he always followed his throw. He made sure his arm went all the way through and followed his throw. That's why his ball stayed up and just kept going. You don't have to have arm strength to play on the other side of the infield. It helps, but you don't have to have it if your feet work. If you prepare the ball correctly, if you get into the perfect throwing position, you can play on the other side of the field, despite what some people may tell you. <clears throat> There's a drill I like to use. We're going back to the throwing part of it. So making sure we had enough time before I hit some of these drills. The kid that's going to, you're going to tell him to, to separate thumbs down. And he's going he's to try what you say, but once he gets in here and he's going to go thumbs down, he's going to be one of these, he's going to turn it over back here. He's going to turn it over at the back because that's what he's been doing. That's all he knows. Okay, how do I stop that? Easy drill. Get a bucket of balls. And you put a ball in the palm of your hand and stand right behind him. So I have a ball right here in my hand. He's going to stand in front of you and he's going to reach back. He's going to get his front side. Everything's set. Now, if the ball is in my palm of my hand, I can't grab the ball on the side. I can't grab it underneath. I won't let him. The ball's in my hand. He can't grab it over here. He can't go underneath. He has to grab it on top of Bingo. There's the key word on top. So when he reaches back, that's the only way he can grab the ball. He's on top of the ball. And as soon as he grabs it, you tell him to throw it. He doesn't have time to turn it over. 25 or 30 of those daily for about a week, he's fixed. Put the ball in your hand where he has no option but to grab it, thumbs down the correct way. As soon as he grabs it like that, don't let him think about it because he's going to pick it up and then turn it over. Say, as soon as you grab it, throw it. Grab it, throw it. You'll have him fixed within a week.
Feet, field, funnel, footwork, fire, follow. <clears throat> when we're talking about, when I do my drills, ground balls and early work, I always tell my, my film fillers, I want the first baseman to catch the ball going towards you. That way he can help you. A lot of times we're talking about we throw the ball over here in practice and we don't say anything. I say something. Anytime in my workouts, in my early work, the guy I have playing first base going out early, taking throws for a player, if he goes this way to catch it, I stop the drill. That's not what I want. In a game, he's out, he's out. In practice, I'm going to be perfect. This is first base and I continually go out here. I'm not satisfied with that. I want my first baseman to catch the ball like this. Why? Right here. Here's the difference. One, two. How many steps are decided? How many plays at first base are decided by two steps or less? There you go. There it is right there. Your first baseman has to be able to help you. Don't be satisfied with that one. If that happens in the game, he's out, he's out. But in practice... I want to be perfect. I want to get that ball to where my first baseman can help me and save me extra steps. Balls that go down the line, my first baseman can't help me. Two drills I do every day. This is how I start my day. I put the infielder on his knees. Oh, I got middle knees. This is hard for me. I get about 20 feet, 25 feet away. I have a fungo I choke up on, and I have somebody constantly feed me balls. When I go out early, and especially at your level, some of these fields teams have practiced on before, or maybe it's a dry day, or in the field's hard. The last thing I want is the first time I step out on the field and I have a coach whacking me a ground ball at 80 miles an hour. And then you expect, get in front, Johnny. Here. <laughs> That's what I would do. Here, you get in front. So I, what I want to do is I want to warm up my hands. You know, hitters warm up in the batting cage on a tee. Pitchers throw a side work. Hitters on on deck circle swing a little way to bat. You know, what do infielders do? We just go out there and field ground balls. I think there's a better way. I'm going to put them on their knees. I'm 15 or 20, 25 feet away at the fungo. Now, if you got younger kids, you can get away and you can roll these balls. You can roll them. But what I want to do is I'm going to roll a ball over here, and all I'm doing is I'm warming up my hands. I'm going to hit a ball to the forehand side. I'm going to funnel it and discard it. Then I'm going to hit one to the backhand side. I'm going to backhand it, funnel it, discard it. And that's how I'm going to warm up my hands to start my day. About 20, 25 of these. I'm warming up my hands. The second drill I do is I'm still 20, 25 feet away with a bucket of balls, and I get into the perfect fielding position, a wide base. And I'm going to hit the ball right at them, hard. If you got young kids, you take the ball and just roll it to them. What I'm, what I'm reinforcing now, before I start my day, I'm reinforcing the perfect fielding position. So the first five or six, before I hit the ball, they have to nod their head because I'll put a ball right down in front of me on the ground and they're going to have their glove out in front. They're going to look at that ball beside me and they're going to nod their head that they can see the ball and their glove in the same view. When I see that nod, I'll whack it. And I want to make sure that can happen five to seven times. After that, I know they're in the perfect fielding position, and then I just keep them coming. So they're going to funnel and get rid of it, funnel and get rid of it, funnel and get rid of it. So I'm practicing the wide base, the perfect fielding position, and I'm practicing the funnel, getting the ball back into the perfect throwing position. Then I'm discarding the balls. Those are the two drills I start. There's a lot more drills, but I start with those two every day before I take somebody out onto the field over on the side. Knees and wide base. <clears throat> Last thing here, I'm running out of time. My early work. When you take a kid out and you're teaching a new skill, it's hard when you start whacking the ball right away. I roll more balls than I hit in spring training. If you roll the ball, you can control the drill easily, and it's much easier to teach when you can control and roll the ball. That's how I lay the groundwork. Now I'm working with major league players. It doesn't take me long to roll the ball. I need to see what I need to see. Sometimes I don't. I keep rolling them, and we talk about it. But I roll the balls first. Then I use the fungo. 
The fungo, I can control the drill. If I'm working on balls to my left, I know I can hit a ball to his left every time with the fungo. Or if I'm working on a ball to his backhand side, I know I can control that. So that's what I work on. I use the fungo to control the ball. And then I always end the, or end the session with the soft toss. I'm sure you've not done this before. I put the player out at their position. I have another coach that soft tosses to me. I'm facing, I got a stance at home plate. Pitcher, I have game angle. He tosses me the ball and I whack it. Hopefully I hit the, the balls that I know he's working on that day. But if I don't, if I miss hit it, then he can't cheat. In his mind, he knows he may have to do some backhands. Or maybe I cue it and he hits a slow roller. But then I play him game ready, game situations. And then I do the, in the early work drills on soft toss. <clears throat> so my suggestion is just don't go out and start whacking ground balls. Warm up the kids' hands. Warm up the perfect throwing and fielding positions. Let them get loose, moving their feet by rolling the ball. Control the drill. Know what you want to do, why you want to do it. Let the kids see it. Control the drill with the fungo and then end it with a soft toss and make some game situations if you have to. Okay, I'm almost done. Feet, field, funnel, footwork, fire, follow. You can teach it to an eight-year-old, teach it to a big leaguer. These principles, in my opinion, once you learn these, you're done. There's nothing else. You don't have to reteach anything. It's done. Your, your job is done. Now, instead of breaking down everything and talking about the four things the funnel does, all you have to do is say, hey, funnel, funnel thumbs down. And they'll remember, front side, short arm, elbow up, hand on top of the ball. Then your coaching becomes a lot quicker and easier. You got trigger words to use. And you can get a lot more work done because you constantly don't have to stop drills and re-explain everything. Six F's of fielding. Thank you.